Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to the house of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for coming back and to visit us and spending time with us as we open God's word and study with us, says the Lord. We're so thankful. And what an awesome time to be thankful. For God has blessed us mightily. He didn't have to allow us to be here, but he did. And this season of thanksgiving, that we need to thank God for what he's done. And we need to be a blessing to someone else. For all that's going on and the many people that's unemployed and sick because of the virus that's going on, may we be a blessing to someone? That's our role. Anyhow, to be a blessing someone to someone like God has been a blessing to us. I pray that you have an awesome Thanksgiving. But in your Thanksgiving and understanding what God has done, do something for someone else. Amen? Amen. We are continuing in this, with the series of questions that Jesus has asked. Today we are coming from John 14, verses 5 through 11. Coming from the English Standard Version, God's Word. Let us jump right in and see what thus saith the Lord. The scripture says this in John 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever have seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. God's word from the book of John. The title of the sermon comes directly from the word of God. Have I been with you so long and you still don't know? Let us pray. Father God, what a awesome word you have. And we thank you, Lord, that you have opened up our eyes and opened up our hearts that we may hear what thus said the Lord. Lord, we just don't want head knowledge. We want that information to go from our head to our heart, that we may love you, and from our heart to our feet, that we may move and do the things that you've called us to do. Lord, we want to be about our Father's business. So, bless us, Lord that we be able to move and say and do the things that you call us to do. Have your way in your word, Lord, that your people may hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Before we look directly at our text today, I'd like to look at the words of a familiar passage before this. John 14, 1 through 4. 
familiar words to us. These words go like this, and you've probably heard them many times. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know. And the way, you know. Powerful words from Almighty God. These words are very special to me. And for many years, I could not read these words without tears coming to my eyes. These words were selected by my son for the homegoing service of my father. When my son was seven years old, he selected this as the words that the preacher would preach for, for my homegoing, for the homegoing service of my father. The, these powerful words let us know that when this life is over, and it will come to an end, when this life is over, Jesus has prepared an everlasting home for everyone that has accepted him as Lord and Savior of their life. That is good news. And if I preach nothing else, that information in itself is good news and something for, we, for us to know. That when all is done, if you accepted Christ, there's a prepared place for you that's called home, called heaven, called being with God Almighty. That's power. But let's move on. That's not the word for the day. Then I look at some more powerful words. Because God is power. Look, there's some more powerful words that some people today will look at it that they're very easy to understand. And maybe they believe that it's easy to understand because we, we currently have the whole word of God. However, the disciples they didn't have the whole word of God. In fact, the disciples were in the midst of really writing the word of God. Therefore, they may not have understood everything that was happening. And even though we have the complete word, we don't understand everything. But they were a little confused because they had not yet seen the death and the burial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Had not seen it. Therefore, when, when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and, and where I'm going, you know, and the way you know, the disciples didn't understand that. And that's where Thomas come in the picture. Thomas responded to Jesus by saying, Lord, I don't, I don't, I don't know where you're going. I, I don't know the way, the way to get to where you're going. And if I don't know where you're going, how do I how do I know how to follow you? I want to be with you wherever you are. I want to be there, but how do I know if I don't even know where you're going? See, I like Thomas. Thomas didn't know, and Thomas. Decided to ask the question. I don't know where you're going. I don't know how to get to you. See, not only did Thomas didn't know, but the other disciples didn't know either. 
See, too, 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 too many times. We don't know what's taking place, but then we won't ask anybody. See, Jesus had told them. Jesus had told them that we're going to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, I must be killed. I will be killed by the elders, by the elders and the scribe. But on the third day, I will get up again. They heard, but they did not understand what Jesus was saying. See, they didn't get the understanding until after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They had heard. They had heard what Jesus had said about his death, but they did not understand. They had heard and studied the scripture of the Messiah coming, but they did not understand. Even though the Bible had explained to them that Jesus would come into the world and what would happen to them, they did not understand. See, too many times our surrounding and what we know impact what we read and we input what we think we know or what the scriptures and we don't truly understand what thus said the Lord. We don't understand. We did not understand that they did not understand that why did Jesus have to die? We've been waiting on you, Jesus, for so long. And now that you're here, why do you have to die? Why do you have to leave us? It was beyond their understanding. Very hard. It's very hard sometimes when we get an understanding in our mind to change our views, our mind of what we think or how we think things are. Thomas did not understand. So Thomas asked two questions. Two questions. He says, where are you going? And how do I get there? Where are you going? Because I want to be wherever you are. And how do I get there? And Jesus responded to Thomas by saying, I am the way the truth, and the life, and the life. I can imagine Thomas probably was scratching his head and said, what? I, I want to know where you're going. And I want to know how to get there. And you tell me that, that you are the way, truth, and the life. He didn't understand. But we should understand because we have the whole Word of God. We should understand that Jesus had to return to his Father. He had to return to the Father that had sent him on a mission. His destination was heaven with his heavenly Father. And if you want to know how to get there, if you want direction on how to get there, there's only one way. And that's what he said to you. The only way is through me. He says, I am. I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did he really say no one? No one? No, no one? Is that, is that what he really said? If you think about this, this one statement. This one statement turns things upside down. He's the only one. This eliminates the rituals that we go through or we think we need to go to go through to get to the Father. Yeah, you got I have to do this. I have to work here. I got to do this. I got to do this. No, no. We should work for God. But it's not about our works that get us there. Our works is there because we are saved. This also put a damper on a lot of religions. How they said there's many ways to get to God. Many ways to get to God. But Jesus said, I am the only way. I am the only way to the Father. 
See, Jesus have created the way. He had really paved the path for us to get to the Father. It's a, it's a narrow path that we must follow. But it's paved, paved for us. Although it's narrow, there's never a traffic jam. Many people travel it, but you'll never find a traffic jam on this narrow path. Because there's room for all that have a desire to get to the Father. There is room for them. This narrow path will direct us directly to the Father. Now, now, if you decide to get on the path, when you start to walking down this narrow paved path that Jesus has laid out, you see some beautiful things on either side. Of you. Oh, they are beautiful sceneries, and but they are distraction from you getting to your destination. They are distraction. So you almost need to put on blindness as we put on the mule and working in the field. Need to, so you keep focused on where you're going. See, don't get sidetracked with the beautiful scenery on each side. Don't, don't, don't take the detour to just to see what they look like. Too many people have detoured off the path because of the beauty of the things that they have seen, how they look. And you just go see and you find yourself at a dead end. And you find yourself not really able to get back to the path. You've been distracted. Stay on the path. Stay on the path. As you go through this path, you will see also some super highways that cross the path. Because so many people, as they walk down the path, they saw the beauty and they got off. And so many got off that the road is wide. Warning. Warning, stay, stay on the path. The path will lead you to Jesus. It will lead you to Jesus. You have all that you need. All that you need. Stay on the path, and the path will lead you to the Father. I am the way. He paved the way that we can get to the Father. Then he says, I am the, the truth. I am the truth. See, you may have heard many ways to get to the Father. And you have, may have heard many spiritual leaders giving you the many ways you can get there. The Pharisees have given you ways. The Sadducees and even spiritual leaders today have put out ways to get to the Father. Back, you may have heard from family members and even friends. But if these ways it doesn't add up to these ways, then they are not true. They are not true. And we need not to follow them. See, I understand the situation that we're in today that is hard to understand the truth. It's hard. Because today, we have decided, notice what I said, we have decided to believe a lie instead of the truth. It is amazing today when you look at our environment that we know that it's a lie. We know it. Yet, because somebody says it, we believe it. Jesus is the only truth. He said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the light. God is light. He is the source of light, and nothing exists without God. See, God created us from the dust of the ground. And once he created us and molded us, God breathed life into our bodies, and we became a living soul. He is the light. 
So I know some of you may be saying that that was God that breathed life into us. How is it that Jesus is this life also? I'm glad you asked. If you look at the scriptures that we're about to, receive, about to cover, we will see the oneness. The oneness of the Father and the Son. And how he becomes, or how he is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 7 says, if you, if you have known me, you would have known my Father also. See, the disciples knew Jesus. And they say, thought they knew Jesus. They had walked with Jesus, and Jesus has been teaching them, but yet they didn't understand Jesus. They didn't understand or have a deep understanding of him. I wonder, I wonder in our life, how many of, how many of us have known people for a long time, and yet we don't understand them, and we don't know them? See, the disciples did not know the relationship between the Father and the Son. They did not understand the role of the Father and the Son. They did not know that even though they had seen Him. They did not understand that Jesus must come to the world and must die and must be, must raise again, be raised again from the dead. Part of them not understanding is built with the fact is made from the fabric that's built in them of their own ideas of how things should be. Too many times we have our own understanding how things should be. And even if they are wrong, we have a hard time changing our view. See, this same question. That the apostles asked. Same thing that the Jewish people said. Where is the Father? They wanted to know. Jesus' answer was the same. He said, you know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. The answer is the same. They didn't know. They had seen. They had walked. They had listened. But they didn't understand who the Father was. See, if they had understood who Jesus was, who Jesus was, then they would have understood that he's spiritual. And that his kingdom is spiritual. And that he was go back to heaven where he came from. Where he took off royalty and came to earth. That he's going back to there. See, Jesus is here. Jesus came to the earth to create that path that was destroyed in the Garden of Eve. When Adam sinned and got kicked out of the garden the path was closed. And Jesus came back to earth to show us the way to get back to the Father. He's done that now. The path is there. Now, Jesus makes another <laughs> incredible statement that blows my mind. Not only has he said that, he said, from now on, from now on, you know him and have seen him. I can imagine Thomas. I can imagine Thomas really thinking that, oh, what are you, what are you, what are you saying now? I don't understand. See, when you said something about the father, um, um, where you was going, I didn't get it. Now you're saying something about, we have seen him? We have seen him? I know Thomas was about to ask the question. But instead of Thomas this time, Philip. 
ask the question. And Philip said, Lord, show us. Show us the Father. And if you show us the Father, that will be enough for us. Show us the Father. See, it's so awesome that these disciples were so intent. They listened to every word that Jesus has said. They listened to him. And that's where their questions come from, is what Jesus has already said. When Jesus says, uh, I go to prepare a place for you, and uh, where I go, you know, and, and, and how to get there, you know, Thomas asked the question. Because he didn't know. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, you have seen him. And Philip jumps in and says, show us. Show us the Father. Because I don't think I've seen him. And Jesus looked at him again and probably said, I can only imagine. He said, Philip, Philip, do you remember when you were searching for me, the Messiah? And you called Nathan and said, we have found him? We have found the Messiah? And now you're asking me to show you the Father? Are you asking me for something that you already know and see? You call me the Messiah. Maybe we speak words that we don't understand. Or maybe the words that come out of our mouth that our spiritual knowledge lags behind it. Lags behind it. See, did he understand? Or did he make the statements of the words? Here's something that's interesting. And it blends into other questions that Jesus had asked. One of the questions Jesus asked that I preached on, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? So, when you are asking the question, show us the Father, I may ask you the question is, what are you looking for? Are you, are you, are you looking for a man that's 6'2", He's dark, handsome, well-spoken. It, it, is, is that what you're looking for? That's not only eloquent in speech, but he have a job and money in the bank. Is that what you're looking for? Or are you looking for the visible representation of God? See, the scripture tells us that God is a spirit. And a spirit doesn't have a body that maybe what you are asking me to show you. The spirit doesn't have a body. So what is it that you want me to show you that will satisfy your mind that he is the Father? See, the scripture tells you also that Jesus is a spirit that was made flesh that you see. Now you see me and you still don't understand me. What would you like to see? That would ease your mind and please your spirit that is God. He's a spirit. Obviously, that Jesus is a spirit and talking to you right now, yet it doesn't please you. He said this, it would be enough for us if we could see the Father. The disciples wanted really a visible representation of the Father that they could see. Hmm. You think that this would be something new? You think it would be something new that you're asking God to show you a visible representation of God? Not so. Nothing new under the sun. Exodus, Exodus 33 deals with the same issue. Where Moses 
God having a conversation. And God told Moses that I have favor with you and my people. And God and Moses said, Lord, show us your glory. That we may know that you have favor with us. Same thing. They want to see the Father. And God said, yes, I have favor. And yes, I will grant you this wish. But no one can see the Father's face and live. I will place you in the cliff and I'll place my hand upon your face. And, and when I pass by, I'll remove my hand that you will see the backside of my glory. Because no one can see my face and live. And God did that. And what we're looking at in the verse today, we're now dealing with the disciple wanting to see the same thing that he's already done. He's already done. It's interesting and amazing to me how God has so much patience with his children. So much patience. I can imagine how great teachers and parents teach their children. Keep showing them the way. They keep holding their hand and wondering, wondering how long will they keep holding their hands that they may understand. Verse 9 says, Have I been with you so long? And you still don't know. How long? How long has it been? How long has it been? And you don't know. me. See, we're not talking about these three and a half years that, that Jesus had been walking with the disciples. No. no. See, see, Jesus was there before conception. Jesus was there before you were born. He said, I know you. Before you even thought about it in anybody's mind. I knew you. I knew you. In fact, I formed you. And not only that, but after I formed you, I fed you, I clothed you, I, put, shel I sheltered you. And even I changed your dirty diapers. Yes, I took care of you. I protected you from your enemy. Yes. How long? I even when you had a cold. I even lowered your temperature. How long has it been and you don't you still don't know me? You 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 have come to church. Sunday after Sunday, you have come. To church to praise me. Yet. You don't know me. You have come to Bible study. And open up your word. To study the word. And, and yet. You don't know me. You have taught other family members. And friends. The, the word of God. Yet. You don't know me. But notice one thing. That Satan. Know me and understand me. After all this, you still don't know. Jesus asked another question. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? In other words, he said, we are one. We are one. And if you believe this, then you already have seen me. If you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, then you already believe this. And you already have seen the Father. Because we are one. Now, don't blame the disciples for not knowing because even today, we argue about the oneness of Christ. We argue about the True, the true on God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we try to explain that, yet 
We do not understand. And in that same verse, he says, the way, the words that I say to you, I do not speak of myself on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. In other words, all the words that I have spoken to you, that you have heard from birth to now, and especially these last three and a half years, those words that you've had, you've heard, comes from the Father. The Father has given me the words, and I have in turn given you the words. And then he said, not only the words, but those miracle things that you have seen, they all have come from the Father. See, I couldn't come from the Father. So when you see the Father in action, you also see the Son. Or should I reverse that? Whenever you see the Son in action, you see the Father. In verse 11, Jesus makes a statement. After all that's being said, he said, believe me. Believe me that I am the Father, that I am in the Father and the Father's in me. Or else believe on account of the works. What are you looking for? Have you seen the miracles? Have you seen the miracles that Jesus has done. That came from the Father. How he turned water into wine. How he gave sight to the blind. How the lame walk. Hmm. How the deaf hear. How the dead is raised from the grave. How demons are being cast out. And the gospel is being preached. Have you not heard? Jesus has done these things that one may know that I and the Father are one. We are in unity of one another. And if you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. He said, believe me. Believe me. Believe. This title in itself. Have I been with you so long? Yet you still don't believe. It almost reminds me of a song. Have you been with me so long? I can't think of the name of it. Have, I, have you known me for so long, yet you don't know? If you don't know me by now, that's it. If you don't know me by now, you'll never know me at all. If we have walked with Christ and known him for so long, and we don't know him by now, at least if we don't know him, before we close our eyes, we will never, ever, ever know him. At all. Let me leave with one thought. We have recognized that the disciples did not understand things that Jesus had said. We have identified that they didn't understand because they had not seen the final picture. They had not seen the death, burial, and resurrection. We have had an upper hand on them because we have the whole word of God. They had studied the word and knew that the Messiah was coming. Yet, they have their views on how things were going. We are about to enter. No one knows when. About a time frame that we too have read about. The last day. When Jesus will come back again. Because he said in the scripture. That if I go to prepare a place for you. Then I will come back. To receive my own. He's coming back. And when he comes back. 
It has been written, but yet we have not lived through it. Some of us will be greatly surprised if we, not have, if we have not accepted Christ on what would happen to us we may have our own understanding of what will happen, but what does the Word of God say? When He returns, He may say, separate from me, because I know you not. Or well, we pray that He say, if we accept it, that my good and faithful servant come on in. When He come back, something that we have not lived through, but we must live through. But one thing we know for sure, that the truth, that the truth, that God, what he said what he would do, he would do. Have you known him so long? Have he been with you so long that you really don't know him? Get to know him. Get to personally know him, not at the surface level, but get to know him. God's will. Amen. Father, awesome is a word that we use to describe you. But awesome doesn't really give meaning to you. We only use the word awesome because, at least I use it because my vocabulary is not great enough to really, truly describe how great you are. We're so thankful that you have paved the way that we can follow a path that you have paved. You came to earth to be in the form of a man to make a way that we can get back to the Father. And you've done your will. And I pray, oh Heavenly Father, that we follow the path. And we stay on the path. Till our days are over, that we can see the Father. And he can say, our good and faithful servant, come on. God's What a powerful word from Almighty God. And I pray that God will just deal with you on that word. Maybe I didn't say it the way you want to hear it. Maybe you didn't understand what I said. But I pray that this seed has been planted. And the Holy Spirit that dwells in all of us since he's gone. Will stir up that word in your spirit. And you will know God. God's word. See you next week with another word from Almighty God. Amen.